logging on and watching wherever you are watching us from. Uh, we really do appreciate it. It's been a great encouragement and a tremendous blessing to see some of the locations people have told us they're at. Let me read through a list. Uh, first things first, those watching here in the United States, obviously here in California, some locally, uh, some to the southern part of California, some far north. Amen. Nebraska, Ohio, Utah, we had two people watching there. Texas, Florida, Washington State, Oklahoma, Michigan, Iowa, Kentucky, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, New York, Pennsylvania, Nevada, South Dakota, Virginia, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Missouri, and Arizona. And uh, abroad, let me read locations people have identified from around the world. In the Bahamas, someone was watching us last week from there, um, the Isle of Malta, Lithuania, uh, Achu, which is thank you in Lithuanian for those, those of you here that didn't know that, Norway, we had two in Argentina, Thailand, Germany, two in Singapore, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Malaysia, two people there, Canada, at least three people there, Australia, four or five people there. We had 11 people who said they were watching from the Philippines. One person in Zambia, another in Honduras, I think two in Honduras actually, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Finland, Indonesia, uh, Terima Kasi, that's thank you very much in Indonesian, Scotland, two in Mexico, two in South Africa, two in India, and one in Guyana. So all of that is a tremendous blessing to us. So again, thank you. I think we had more people watching from around the world than we're actually watching here in the U.S., and I can't tell you how wonderful that is to us. And uh, let me also mention how you can help us if God lays it upon your heart to help us. If you'd like to make a donation to our ministry, not only so we can keep our facilities running and the lights on and the water running in hopes that God lets us meet as a church once again, but also we want to fulfill promises we've made to Bible-believing missionaries all over the world. And uh, we don't want to fail in those promises. They depend on us and other churches like us to pay their bills and raise their children so that the preacher doesn't have to go out and work a job in another country and then try to be a missionary when he comes home. And two primary ways you can help us. Uh, through the U.S. Postal Service, you can write to us at BBCI, BBCI, P.O. Box 267, Stanton, California, S-T-A-N-T-O-N, California, 90680. Uh, or you can go to bbcenglish.org. That's our website. And on the main page, you'll see a spot at the, begin, at the top that tells you where to click if you'd like to donate via the internet. And uh, we'll leave that with, you, with between you and God. And I want to say again, thank you so much. Let's get to our sermon for today. Today is Mother's Day, too, by the way, in the United States and in other countries. Some of you who are several hours ahead of us, some of you are watching on Monday, May the 11th already. And we're still on May the 10th. But um, I know May the 10th is Mother's Day in Cambodia uh, and other places around the world. So... Thank you uh, to moms, and thank you for what mothers do for us and our families. Let me have you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 4. 1 Peter, chapter 4. And we'll begin there at verse 12. 1 Peter, chapter 4. And let me begin reading at verse 12. Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, 
that when his glory shall re be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Notice verse 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Romans 8 verse 18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There is no real way to compare the misery, the hardship, the trials and problems of this life with the glory that will be manifested in you by the wonderful grace of God and Jesus Christ someday. There's no way the two can even be laid alongside each other. In 1981, Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote uh, or published a book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And it was very well received, became a bestseller. And he tried to describe the things he and his wife learned after the death of their 13-year-old son so that he could take that advice and maybe help others in the future who go through similar trials. His book was not entitled, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People. If you could answer the question, why is this thing happening, happening to me? Why is this problem taking place right now? Why is my family going through this ordeal? Why do my children no, want, no longer want to speak to me? Why did my marriage fall apart? Why did this person get sick? Why did this person die? If you could answer that question, why this is happening? What greater good can come from it? You could make a fortune answering people's questions or dispensing advice, or you might become suicidal because you could see the road somebody else is on and you know where it's going to lead them to their own ruin and you might not be able to dissuade them, get them off that road onto something else. But the fact of suffering has become one of the main arguments used by atheists and many agnostics to reject God altogether. They'll, they'll ask, how could a loving God allow such tragedy and pain and misery to come into the world and afflict so many people? And you'd like to ask, why do you find such fault with someone you say doesn't exist? You can't find a character flaw in someone who's not there. But they think if they can find uh, or illustrate some character flaw, some moral shortcoming in God, it disproves his very existence altogether, but it doesn't work that way. It's not logically possible. But suffering is an inescapable part of life. The pain and misery that's um, inflicted on some people. Why are we going through this COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic? And more and more, it's looking like a plandemic because it seems that governments all over the world are using this to leverage themselves against the people. Yeah. And to reduce the influence, reduce the strength and the power of great um, uh, self-governing nations, independent nations, productive nations, nations that believe in the democratic rule and independent uh, governance of themselves versus those who are more top-down so socialistic. And that seems to be manifesting itself more and more everywhere you go. But why are these things happening? Why this? Why here? Why now? Why me? You know, nobody's ever gone through as many problems and is suffering as much as you're suffering, right? We've all had that feeling and that thought at times. But let's take up the problem of suffering. The problem of suffering. I've got three reasons as to why men suffer. These won't answer every single particular, not right away, but these will cover just about all. If you have some problem, some a disturbance, some trouble in your home, in your family, in your marriage, with your children, on your job, with your boss, with your income, with your health, any number of these things, if you trace it back, you can trace that problem to one of these three reasons I'm about to give you. 
So I want you to pay close attention. Maybe it'll help. I pray that it does. But first of all, men suffer because of Adam's sin. Because of Adam's sin. The Bible says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Romans 5, verse 12. Imagine living in perfect conditions, in a perfect climate. You had access to the tree of life and you could live indefinitely. You were the commander of all the animal species that came to you. They would obey your word. There were no fluctuations in extreme weather, cold and heat, uh, neither of which were desirable. It would be a perfect climate, no sweat, no labor, no um, fatigue, painless childbirth, ladies. You would have fellowship with God himself in the garden each day. God told Adam to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, Genesis 1, verse 28. Now, if Adam and his wife <clears throat> had never sinned, that had never entered into the picture, then there would be no need for God to dispense the judgment that he promised. And if that judgment never came, it's safe for us to conclude Adam and his wife would still be alive today, still doing what God had told them to do, still being fruitful, still multiplying, still replenishing the earth. And with that being said, there'd be a whole lot of people in the world right now. Rather than the seven and three quarter billion we have in the world now, we might have 700 billion in the world now. The earth is not big enough to hold all of the descendants that would have come from Adam if Adam and Eve were still alive today. There'd be a whole lot of people, which means that Adam's domain couldn't just be limited here to the earth. It would have to expand into the universe because sin would have never entered into the creation. But as the Apostle Paul says, sin entered into the world and death by sin and things sure went downhill after that. Amen. In Greek mythology, the first woman to be created was named Pandora. She was created by Zeus, the sun god, and through her curiosity, she opened a jar, some accounts say a box, and inside that container was every form of evil and suffering and pain and misery and affliction and war and bloodshed and uh, every other form of uh, unhappiness that could be unleashed upon the world. But by that time, it was too late for her to gather it and put it back in. It was now let loose. And so you'll often hear the expression opening Pandora's box. If you do that, you're going to cause more problems than good. Well, you can easily see how this reflects the account of Eve in the Garden of Eden which we believe is the true account. But the Greeks and the Romans and the Egyptians and their mythologies all seem to have borrowed from the original story of Adam and Eve in the garden of paradise where God told them to be fruitful and to multiply. And I'll give you one rule, if you break it, then this is going to happen. So they broke it and God had to keep his word. God told Adam that because of his disobedience, quote, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Genesis 3, verses 17 and 19. Now, I hadn't planned on mentioning this, but I've been working a day job in the funeral business for the last uh, 33 years, nearly 34 years. And at least once a year, someone will ask me, do you think it matters if someone is buried or if they're cremated? And I had never given it much thought. It really didn't matter to me at all. But when people began to ask, then I had to think, well, what would be the best answer to that question? Now, before I give you the answer I sometimes give, some of you are already thinking, I know the answer to that, Pastor Shribe. It's this or it's that. 
But let me just stop you before you interject. If you embalm a body, you bury that person's body, it may prolong the decay process by months, sometimes years. Or if you cremate them, it will hasten the decay process. But either way, the body is going to go back to nothing but granules or um, bits and pieces, dust. You open the casket 20 years later and you've got old deteriorated clothing and just dust where the bones have decomposed. So either case, the body goes back to the same state. For dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. So really in the big picture, I don't think it matters in the eyes of the Lord what someone does. We live in a day and time now where for economic reasons, a lot of people just opt for the cremation because they figure why waste so much money on that? Uh, and I understand the logic behind that. And prices of these things never go down, they always go up anyway. So I don't have any problem with someone whose loved one is cremated. I have no problem either way. God's curse on the earth became the reason for the natural disasters we see around us, the reason for uh, hurricanes and floods, flash floods, the reason for the tectonic plates shifting as geologists describe to us, the reason for extremes in weather, the reason for any number of diseases, the reason for uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus or the Wuhan Chinese virus or whatever the right term is for it today, the reason for any number of afflictions and maladies and uh, children born with birth defects and so forth. The Lord told the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in thy, excuse me, uh, and thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee, Genesis 3, verse 16. It was God who told the man that he would sweat and labor when he tried to till the ground and bring forth food for himself. It was God who told the woman that she would suffer uh, pain and be subservient to her husband in childbirth. Every uh, expectant mother wants to be as healthy as she can be and bring forth the healthiest baby that she can bring forth. All of its fingers, all of its toes, every organ in place, every faculty functioning as it should, ears, eyes, every other um, uh, sense, sense operating as it should operate. But in the end, the man and the woman eventually died and returned to dust. There's a curse on the ground. God said, cursed is the ground for thy sake. There's a curse on the ground, and everything you eat comes from the ground. Animals eat from the ground, and you eat the animals. So either directly or indirectly, everything you eat comes from the ground. You read about beauty creams and beauty compounds, every... Uh, derivation, every extraction, every compound, women are rubbing on their faces to look young and youthful. You're smearing death all over your face because it all comes from the ground ultimately. But men suffer largely because of Adam's sin. Secondly, let me say this. Men suffer not only because of Adam's sin, but they suffer because of other men's sins. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The Bible admonishes because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. When someone gets away with something they know they shouldn't do, they knew better before they engaged in it. But when they get away with it, it emboldens them. It gives them courage to try and do something else. Let's see what else I can get away with. It's like a game with some people. Let's move on to something else. Well, that didn't thrill me. I felt good for a while, but it, the fun is uh, worn off. What else can I do? Swift and fit punishment for a crime is a very effective deterrent against other crimes and other people trying to imitate it. You know what they call copycat crimes? When someone is guilty of committing murder, 
Don't let them sit in prison for 40 years until they die of old age with endless appeals. Execute them. Execute them while the crime is still fresh in the minds of the public, while it hasn't been off the headlines very long, and everyone that was involved or affected is still alive. They can see punishment being meted out. Amen. They, don't let people stay in prison at taxpayers' expense where they can write their memoirs and have access to the Internet and exercise gym and the best food and health care. You got people who are outside of prison who don't have as many amenities and luxuries as people inside prisons. <laughs> Execute them while the matter and the issue is still fresh. It serves as a warning to someone who would try to imitate it. The Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. The greed for wealth and personal success uh, is at the heart of the pornography business, the heart of the liquor business, the heart of the drug traffic, the heart of any number of things, the heart of the, the gambling industry. It's at the heart of just about every immoral thing that you don't want your children to get caught up in. And you, you're ashamed, if, it, if you're actually honest, if you have any character, you should be ashamed that you got stuck doing that. It depleted your family income, it ruined your health, it ruined your reputation. You lost friends because of that problem. It, you lose the respect of your children because of it. But sometimes suffering comes from being in the path of somebody else who is out looking, for them, looking after themselves. Someone who seems like they're minding their own business and somebody else comes along and gets in their way. Somebody else has the free will. You have a free will, but so do other people. They've made bad decisions. Sometimes their decisions come and they cross your path and cause injury to you. There are people who, as like a bit about 18, 19, 20 years ago, here in the United States, what they call the Enron scandal. Enron was a, an energy uh, company, and Bernard Madoff, who was the CEO of that corporation, uh, ultimately was convicted, and I'm not sure if he died before he went to prison, but uh, died not long after. And um, people who had spent years, 25, 30 years working for that company, and they were making profits like no other company. In fact, they had been recommended as one of the best investments people could make for five, six years in a row, and Forbes and Fortune 500 and so forth. And then it was, became public knowledge that they were borrowing money from this account to pay debts in that account, and they're shifting money around, hoping the IRS would not find out. They had one set of financial books they would show to the government, and another that reflected the more accurate statement, which was in bad shape. So people who had worked for that company for 30 years, they're getting ready to retire, and their uh, employee profit sharing plan hopefully promised them 300, 400, some people half a million dollars to retire. Now, half a million dollars to retire with 20 years ago was a good retirement. And yet people who had spent 30 years of their life working for this corporation ended up with nothing. They lost it all because a few people at the top got greedy and made bad decisions, and they hired attorneys who would make even more bad decisions, hoping the media would never find out, hoping the government would never find out. Well, eventually it did. Numbers 32, verse 23 says, be sure your sin will find you out. The natural lusts of, of the fallen nature are behind so much crime, so much misery, so much pain, so much um, affliction, so much warfare, so much bloodshed, so much violence, so much robbery, theft, fraud, deception. They're behind so many things because people are out trying to cut corners and get away with something that's quick and easy. Credit card companies want some young married couple to go into debt as soon as possible. As soon as my wife and I were married, we began getting forms in the mail from different credit companies saying, fill this out, send it in, we'll mail you your charge accounts, your charge cards, I should say. They don't care if you end up in financial ruin. They want you obligated to them for the rest of their, your lives. They don't care what happens to your home. They don't care what happens to your marriage. All they want is some money out of your pocket. And so they make it real easy for you to apply, get the credit card, get the charge account, 
and uh, whatever happens after that's your problem. The Bible says, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. 1 John 5, verse 19. But people cause suffering in the lives of others by their own cruelty, by their own selfishness, by their own clever plans to cut corners or cheat on this, hoping to promote themselves to get ahead over somebody else. It's not you first and me second. It's me first and you maybe. That seemed to be how people operate in life. The Bible says, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Titus 1, verse 15. We should clarify some of our terms, however. When I say uh, bad things happening to good people, ultimately the Bible says there is none good and there is none righteous. No, not one. Romans 3, verses 10 to 12. So ultimately, there is none that is good without any sin whatsoever. So in the big picture, there is none that is good enough to get to heaven on his own. So these people that lost so much money in the, the Enron scandal, to say, well, they were good people, they were innocent people, they weren't hurting anybody. How many of those people might have lied when they filed their own income taxes every year? How many of those people were cheating on their spouse? How many of those people were committing adultery with other people in the office pool? How many of those people were misusing company funds, maybe out of the petty cash drawer, or doing any number of things? It finally caught up with them. The idea that there's uh, none good, no, not one, um, is true enough, but the idea that there's none um, bad, that's even more laughable. That's even more laughable. Thirdly, and, and lastly today, let me say this, Men suffer not only because of Adam's sin, not only because of other men's sins, they suffer because of their own sins. They suffer because of their own sins. Isaiah wrote, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, verse 6. Men possess a free will, but men have chosen foolishly. They've chosen very foolishly. When President George W. Bush was being hounded by the news media and the Democratic Party, saying that he had a, a ticket driving under the influence when he was a young man, and that should disqualify him from running for, for running for president, he had a great reply to that. He would say, when I was young and foolish, I was young and foolish. What else can I say? Accept responsibility and move on. But your free will is constantly at war with the divine holy will of God. The Apostle Paul recognized this. He says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Romans 7, verse 18. Man is a triune being, body, soul, and spirit, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. The spirit of a saved man wants to please God, wants to do those things that will honor Jesus Christ and make God proud, make God happy with him. But the flesh of a saved man or the flesh of an unsaved man, doesn't matter. The flesh wants to do something else. The flesh wants to satisfy itself, whatever feels good, whatever cuts corners, whatever's quick and easy and uh, gives me a shortcut to wealth or to success or to fame or to any number of things. The real you is a soul. The Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, Genesis 2, verse 7. So the real you is a soul, but you're being pulled in two directions. Will I yield to the Spirit 
and please God and honor Jesus Christ. Do those things that I know God would want me to do and bring honor to him. Or will I yield to my own flesh, my own selfish desires, my own wants, and get away with something that's really technically a bit of cheating, cutting corners, being less than honest, making a representation of myself that isn't quite honest, just to please someone, which direction will I go? You've seen the little cartoons of someone with a devil on this shoulder and an angel on this shoulder, and they're both whispering into the ear of the person, go this way, no, go that way. The real you is a soul, and it's got two directions to go in. Romans 6, verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The Apostle Paul likens righteousness and death as being persons, having personality, and each one of them is calling to you, telling you to go this way or to go that way. And each one will have its own set of consequences. Sin is very deceptive to the one engaged in it. But sin will rob you of any ambition. It will ruin your reputation. It will ruin your home life. It will ruin your marriage. It will ruin your relationship with your children or your parents. It will ruin your reputation on the job. It will ruin you financially. It will do any number of things. It will ruin your health. It will ruin your name and reputation in the city you live in. Not only do men sin because of Adam's, or, or rather suffer because of Adam's sin, they suffer because of other men's sins. And lastly, let me say, they suffer because of their own sins. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, verse 23. That means your mother. That means your father. That means your children. That means your boss. That means your boyfriend, your girlfriend. That means the next door neighbor. That means the, the mailman, the postman. That means someone you're logging on, talking to on the internet. That means me. That means you. And if all have sinned, all need to be forgiven. That, that seemed to be a logical conclusion. If all have sinned, all need to be forgiven. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, when you work a job, you earn a wage. It might be the minimum wage, an hourly wage, a salary. But you earn something for what you do. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So what you earn for sinning against God's divine law is death. Physical, spiritual, eternal death. But the rest of that verse is the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. A gift is something you can't work for. A gift is something you can't earn. It's offered to you freely. The only thing required of you is to reach out and take it. These dumb Calvinists who think, if I reach out and consciously decide to take it, that constitutes work. No, it constitutes obedience. And if you don't do that, you're a fool. And if you insist that my reaching out and consciously deciding that I'm a sinner and I need to be forgiven, I'm asking God to save me, forgive me, uh, I'm not going to do that, then you're lost. You're lost. You're, you're not saved yet. You might know a lot of scripture because you read a lot of the Bible at church, but you're still lost. You need to be born again. It's as simple as that. It, the, the fact that the most simple proposition in all of God's creation is to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, to be born again by putting your hope and your confidence in what he did for you, and asking that his righteousness will cover you and your sins will be covered by his death. And a great transaction will take place between you and Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll go from sinner to saint that fast. Now let me ask, before we finish this sermon today, is there someone watching? And we, by the way, let me, I should have said this earlier, we shut down the live comments. Uh, you ought to be watching this after it's posted. Don't be commenting and talking to each other in the right-hand column when you should be listening to the sermon. So, but let me say this. Would you be willing to admit to God, I'm a sinner, 
I'm not going to hide it. I can't deny it. I'm not going to lie and say I'm better than other people. You might not have committed the same sins as somebody else, but if you commit one, you're a sinner. You are born into the world with the nature of your father and mother. They were sinners. So there's no, none that are perfect, none that are without sin in some measure. So would you be willing to admit to God, I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus Christ died for me. And in the best way I know how, I'm asking God that Christ would save me, wash me clean from my sin and the consequence of my sin, helping to know I'm going to heaven one day when this life is over. Make sure my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Save my soul and help me to live for Jesus Christ from this day forward until Christ calls us home. If you can do that, like I say, it's a very simple matter. You admit you're a sinner. You admit you have a need to be forgiven and beg God to do so. He'll save you. He'll wash you clean from yours and he'll make sure your name is written in heaven, which can never be erased. We'd love to hear about that. We'd love to know it. And uh, if you want to pray with uh, right now and talk to God and ask God to save your soul, let me pray as we conclude and uh, you pray with me and ask God to forgive your sins. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. Everything Pastor Shribe said has struck me and I can't hide it and I can't deny it. God, I admit I'm a sinner and I'm lost. And if God is as holy as you should be, then, Lord, there's no way I can get into heaven on my own effort. But I do believe Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, dying for my sake. And in the best way I can, I'm asking that my sins would be covered by his death and you'd wash my soul clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. May his righteousness then cover me. Lord, help me to go from a sinner to a saint for all of eternity. And I'm asking this, God, by the grace of Jesus Christ, Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the word of God. And God, thank you for being willing to save someone like me. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you did that, God bless you. Thank you for watching today. Post a comment under our video. Let me know where you're watching from. It'll be a great encouragement in the week ahead. And uh, so thank you again. And if we don't meet this week, maybe we'll meet in the rapture before next Sunday comes about. That'll be fine with me, and uh, I'm very privileged to have four of our church members today, but don't worry, they're sitting far enough apart, so they can't infect me with their uh, contagion. <laughs> and um, so God bless you. Thank you for watching, and uh, we'll conclude right there. God bless you.